business highlights, we filed 15 BMSPPs across major markets during the quarter. And as on 31st March 2022, cumulative filings stood at 433. Today, we have four other and products compounds in our development pipeline. We also have seven products in the oncology space. Now I would quickly read the disclaimer. Some of the information in the document, especially information with respect to our plans and strategies, may contain certain forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. These statements are based on current expectations, forecasts, and assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties, which could cause uh, which could cause outcomes and results to differ materially from these statements depending upon economic conditions government policies and other incidental factors. Such statements should not be regarded by recipients as a substitute for the exercise of their own judgment. The company undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statement, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. Our actual results may differ materially from those expressed in or implied by these forward-looking statements. With that, I invite Dr. Yasir Rauji to say a few words before we open the floor for the Q&A session. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Rauji. Uh, thank you, Shami, uh, and welcome, welcome to everybody. Good morning to you. Uh, I think uh, after quite a few quarters, we we are probably welcoming uh, people to a more normal world. People have started going back to work. Uh, COVID seems to have left us. Hopefully, of course, there are still some challenges that we see with uh, our customers in Europe and. Uh, but overall, the environment is becoming more normal. So hopefully, this is something that continues. Of course, challenges are going to continue to remain geopolitically. Uh, <clears throat> we know all that. I don't need to speak about it. But then there are, there is an impact of all this on the industry. Uh, I just want to recap. You know the kind of challenges that we faced in the last year. Uh, you know, as a company uh, and for the industry at large. So. We had, we had, if you recall, back in July, August, the whole energy crisis, right, with coal energy suddenly becoming bad energy and everything else uh, being promoted, which resulted in a lot of raw material shortages. And as a result, there was uh, huge price spikes in raw materials. Uh, following that, uh, you know, there was a hit on solvent prices, uh, raw material prices, like I already said. And then there was the Omicron that came and hit, right? And finally, now this this challenge with uh, uh, with you know the the Russia and Ukraine issue that is basically impacting energy prices, particularly gas. So so when we come to Glenmark Life Sciences, how do we see all that? I mean, the good thing is when I look back, I think we've had a fantastic year, and the reason I say that is because. In spite of all all these headwinds, uh, as a company, we've managed to keep our business on track and uh, continue to to build confidence with customers on our ability to to serve them with you know the right quality, the right price, and supply no no interruption in supplies. So this is. I would say these are challenges that we've been able to deal with very successfully. We hope the world will become a more normal place and that, that should help our business to uh, continue on the path of stability as well as growth. I just want to remind you that we, we continue to focus on our short, mid and long-term priorities. The short-term priorities being to retain the customer focus across geographies the midterm focus being to continue to drive our R&D and operations to be more efficient, to to file in time uh, the, uh, across across agents across uh, global regulatory bodies so that we can service our customers across the geographies, and finally, longer term, the plans for expansion, which are happening uh, pretty much on track. There have been a few small delays here and there as a result of Omicron, and I had addressed this in my last uh, earnings call in quarter for quarter three. So um, business is good. Uh, demand is very solid with our customers. Confidence is also very high, and you can see it reflected in our yearly, yearly results that in spite of all these headwinds and challenges, uh, Glenmark Life Sciences continues to to do well uh, and deal with these challenges. So, with that, I'll I'll close my opening remarks and uh, you know look forward to your questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, in order to ask a question, you may please press star and one. The first question is from the line of Neha Manpuria from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question is, you know, just trying to understand if we are seeing any issues uh, in our ability to, uh, you know, source raw material, um, um, you know, because of, um, you know, a lockdown in China. Uh, do you think that could impact, uh, you know, not so, in the coming few months if, if the uh, lockdown extends further than May? Yeah, so thanks, Neha, for the question. Uh, we are watching this situation so far, not likely to impact us because typically we have been seeing uh, delays out of China. Obviously, we didn't predict that this one would come along, but if you recall back in Feb, there was the, the spring break and then the Beijing Winter Olympics. And so we've sort of uh, continued to have a sort of longer supply chain built out of China. And as a result, uh, there is no impact on us. Even this latest crisis uh, is unlikely to impact us unless it stretches for two to three months. Uh, of course, we are still, you know, looking at mitigating, you know, the situation through shipments from other ports. Shanghai port is the uh, largest port uh, that clears hazardous cargo. And as a result of that, you know, the impact on, on our industry is big. But then there are other ports like Ningbo and Qingdao that are, are still functioning and we are still able to manage to get supplies. But Q1, there is no impact. Q2, very little impact. And let's see how it goes. Understood. Uh, and so from a margin perspective, uh, you know, given that we had raw materials going into Chinese New Year and Winter Olympics uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, the gas price increases or crude price increases have come after that, uh, do we see incremental risk to margins, uh, you know, in the next few quarters, particularly, you know, since we also have our CAPEX that will get commissioned in the second half, uh, you know, if you could just get, uh, update us on that too? So, Neha, again, margins, uh, like you said, right, we've already sort of built in and factored in quite a few of these uh, increases, right? So, unlikely to uh, dip any further, uh, you know, we'll continue to maintain margins at similar levels that we've seen in Q3 and Q4. Uh, with, so, I, I think we, we should be okay on, on, on margins. And on the CAPEX, sir, uh, are we on track with the timeline that we'd mentioned in the previous call? Uh, when should we start seeing the backward integration and the uh, other CAPEX? So BI will come in September. September is when we are hoping to get our BI facility. This is the 400 kiloliters at Ankleshwar. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the hedge will come on sooner. So we've got four modules coming at the hedge. Phase one will come in July. And... Uh, so that's well on track. We had a, a couple of months slowdown in the hedge uh, so when Omicron hit because we were not able to bring as many number of, you know, contractors and and uh, labor on the site. So that had already been, uh, you know, we'd alerted, the, uh, you know, earlier in the last. So, I mean, that's, so now it's coming to July. So it's well on track, I would say, I mean, you know. And so from a, uh, the hedge contribution perspective, they should start reflecting in our growth numbers from second half I, I, in that case? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, we because this is a big capacity, if you recall, yeah. it's 240 KL that we are adding. Plus our oncology uh, block is also coming, you know, in the same time frame. Understood. Thank you so much, sir. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is on the line of Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning and thank you for taking my question. Mm -hmm. Just the first one on the two segments of revenue, both generic KPI and CDMO. Uh, if you could help us understand how this would likely pan out in say fiscal 23 in terms of either top line expectations or some kind of an outlook there. And what are the dynamics you're seeing in the both the businesses? I think fourth quarter CDMO business has declined. Maybe it's of a high base or we had some one-off last year quarter. So if you can explain the two businesses, please. Thank you. Yeah, so Sham, uh, let me address the smaller business uh, because that's the CDMO business. So we, w what happens here is that last year, like you mentioned, we were almost, we, we had a we had a huge upside last year, um, and the way we look at it now is with, it was largely a result of stocking because Q4 for us is Q1 for our customer, and they they were in this mode because of you know all kinds of scares on the supply chain to to sort of build up. And so this degrowth we are seeing is a result of that higher base, uh, but we've seen consistent growth uh, in this year and uh, highly encouraged that the CDMO business will, will continue to grow, even though it's on a relatively small base of three projects. So I expect that you know, this, this, is a, this business will continue to grow by all accounts. There is a demand from all our customers on these projects. Uh, you know, there is a fourth project that uh, did get, uh, you know, uh, will probably happen in Q3 of this year, uh, you know, and that, sh that should see, we should see a bigger uptick, uh, you know, in CDMO revenues from Q3 or Q4 of this year. So that's CDMO. As far as generic goes, uh, see, the nice thing about generic is that we are very well distributed across geographies. And uh, so when we look at this last year, for instance, right, while there were some pressures from Europe and, uh, you know, India, right, we, we and a little bit from the U.S., three of the regions have done very well. So Latin, Japan, and even the U.S. has done very well. So as a result of that, you know, the, the slight sort of dips in these other markets have been more than offset by, uh, you know, growth in the, the Japan, Latin, and U.S. markets. So I think this is something that will continue. Uh, Japan, Latin, and U.S. will continue to remain strong, and I believe that Europe uh, should see a comeback because we are introducing, uh, reintroducing some uh, APIs again, second, third, uh, second generation processes again. And they should see uh, a reasonable uptick in the Europe business as well. Uh, India also... I believe will continue to do well. So overall, uh, we are expecting our generic business to to continue to you know drive because it's the biggest business, and regionally also there's strength across the region. Uh, so, Doctor, I said just um, uh, any quantitative guidance on what the revenue growth potentially could be for fiscal 23? Yeah, Sham, I think we should consider between 12 to 14 percent on an overall basis. Uh, for our growth. Fair enough. Uh, just a second question on just d digging deeper into the generic API piece, uh, right? We have seen in different, at least regulated markets, quite a bit of pricing pressure on the formulation companies. So what are you seeing in terms of the trends? Uh, is there a sense that you could pass on some of the, I mean, you give your guidance of margins being stable at Q3, Q4. So what are some of the things that you're building into your expectations for price in uh, for your generic API piece. Okay, so Sham, we've had we've had some success with passing on, uh, you know, uh, price increases to customers, and uh, I think that for those sets of increases, this is something that will is likely to continue. There are other APIs where customers are having a very rough time at the front end, and uh, at this point, we are just you know, in negotiations and discussions with customers on where we can take the price increases because they do realize that we are, we are you know, facing cost pressures. And, uh, but then it's a partnership and we don't want to sort of rock the boat for our customers at the front end and, you know, have them, you know, lose business to competition. So it will be done selectively and judiciously plus 
you know partnering with our customers so that you know they continue to have confidence that we will support them that's the that's the way we are going to approach the whole thing and we've been doing that for the last 3 4 quarters now correct thank you dr asir and all the best thank you thank you thank you before we take the next question we would like to remind participants that you may press star and 1 to ask a question the next question is from the line of vikas sharda from nd asset please go ahead yeah hi good morning asir hi uh, yeah two questions one is that uh, like in, for the previous question you answered that quantitative guidance of 12 to 14% revenue growth uh how would that look like say in the first half or the second half because the base is also plays a role and uh, so is your capacity expansion and uh, how relevant is quarter on quarter growth for your business i mean is that a relevant matrix to look at so because the thing is that we frankly quarter on quarter is not a relevant metric okay things do uh, you know move around and regionally there could be ups and downs so it's difficult to predict right on the year basis we are very uh, confident of this growth coming to the half, first half versus second half for sure second half is likely to be better simply because our ability to service the business is going to be much better on account of the uh, capacity extra capacity that we will have at the age uh plus uh, you know the the bi block that is coming in ashwar will also be operational of course that doesn't in, you know impact our front end capacity in a big way but uh, it will free up things for us from an intermediate perspective so overall i expect that we expect that second half would be uh, you know bigger in terms of growth and first half would be you know uh a little lesser in terms of the growth and and uh, in terms of the margins i mean you expect that q3 q4 margins to sustain but uh, incrementally how do you see the cost pressures even on raw material side as well as the uh, other expenses so today the only big question mark for us right is uh this thing about uh, gas prices see i'll give you a sense right last year uh, july august gas prices were around 35 rupees per standard cubic meter and it jumped up to 62 rupees in a very short time we stayed in the 62 rupee sort of thing for about you know 2 3 months in you know october november and the end of last year and then in march 30% of our supplies are coming at 190 rupees so i mean you can imagine 35 rupees and then now 30% coming at 190 rupees so gas prices are you know going very very bad right and uh, although you know we have mitigated quite a bit you know with switching to coal and briquettes uh, its impact will come second half of the year you know the full impact will come in the second half of the year so they should be i mean this is the only thing that has not been factored into the margin so maybe you know half a point to a point at the max right would if, if this kind of uh, sort of escalating gas prices hit us right then there could be some you know impact uh, in the first half but otherwise i think like i told neha we have covered you know this uh, all the price increases you know through customer negotiations as well as uh, you know there's been quite a bit of improvement on the efficiency side as well and this one and uh, finally any comments on mr pujara's exit <laughs> i like bavesh take that himself <laughs> yeah vikas so there is an exciting opportunity that i don't want to let go of so i brought it up with uh, yasir and management over here so so i think yeah but i think we are closing the year on a good note this also allows us gave us an opportunity to close our results early 
So, and then the foundations are all laid. I think uh, the management uh, is fully committed to uh, deliver the results on the same way we have done so far. So, I think that is it. So I'm looking forward to the new assignment and wishing all the best uh, to Glenmark Life Sciences. Thank yeah, you. I'll add because that Bhavesh has been a great support, right? Uh, he was with us through the IPO, and you know, it, it, it it's not great good to see him go. But then, you know, he's got his, you know, he's got his priorities, and he's sort of moving along with that. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll move on. You know. Yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from DAM Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for taking the question. Yes, sir, uh, on the question about, uh, you know, cost pressures, you know, some of the cost pressures largely are, uh, you know, input cost driven and they should be universal. So at some, at what stage in your expectation, you know, do, do the, does the industry really pass them on to the, to the customers? Yeah, Nitin, I mean, you're right. I, I completely agree that it is it is universal. Everyone's getting hammered by these gas prices as, as well as input prices, you know, particularly on the solvent side, because that's, again, a more universal commodity, and that's driven by more or less by international prices, right? But then the question about, you know, uh, mitigating by passing it on to customers and so on is a is a judgment call that you take, you know, given how the customer is doing in the front end. Okay, so some customers we know are dominant, you know, with the market share and you know they they have a very strong position, unlikely to lose it, and those are the kinds of customers that have agreed to give us, you know, price increases and said that yeah, okay. We understand, of course, we also understand that when things go back to normal, you know, you guys will, will bring down prices. And we are okay to do that because end of the day, we don't want to take advantage of a bad situation. But then there are other customers that are having a, a much more difficult time, you know. I mean, Sham talked about it right in the front end, how people are, uh, you know, in the U.S. market, especially some in Europe, are having a lot of... Uh, challenges because of their because of their uh, you know competition at the front end and the buying patterns in the US with the big three right now probably big four but the thing is that you know with all that happening we need to be a bit more a bit more measured in terms of going to customers and sort of you know asking for a price increase and putting a price increase unilaterally it's being done it's being done through mutual discussion and agreement and i think that's a better way to sort of handle it going forward no, that I completely appreciate. My point is, you know, at a, on a structural basis, assuming this is becomes like a new normal or around these levels of, uh, you know, energy costs and everything. Uh, I mean, does the, so who takes up in your assessment is the, does it mean a margin squeeze for the API industry in general or some of it get passed on to the end, to the formulation guy and eventually the end consumer? I mean, how does that play out in the next year or so? See, the thing, if it, if it's something that continues to be the way it is today, then it has more or less been baked in, right? Okay, so we'll continue and we'll watch, right? But it, let's say if it goes crazy, right? I mean, you know, and it, it becomes unsustainable, then we're gonna have to open it up to the customer and say, look, you know, you take it at a higher price, so then we know we'll, we'll exit eventually, right? We'll support you until, you know, you want us, uh, you know, and then that's it, we'll move. I think that's how we'll take that conversation, I hope. I hope it doesn't go there. It doesn't look like, you know, things are going to get bad. Like I said, even with these gas prices going to 190 rupees, I mean, the overall impact is not going to be that significant. Like I said, half a point to a little more than half a point, but that's about it. I don't think it's going to, you know, alter the overall look and feel of the business. Fair enough. So I just probably push it a little bit around that. So now, you know, some of these gas issue, energy cost issues are more acute for companies in Europe. And I presume in some of your APIs, uh, I mean, A, to, uh, are there any relevant European c competitors in some of your products? And two, uh, have, they been, have you been uh, expecting or seeing any meaning larger impact on those players' ability to compete in the market? 
I think, could you please repeat that question? I'm sorry, but the last part I missed what you said. I, I, what I meant is, you know, in Europe, Europe has a more acute problem on the energy side. So are are we seeing a more compared, favorable competitive position for Indian players versus the European player competitors uh, in probably some of the products where you, uh, are where you competing with them? No, I'm not referring to the European competition. Um, we see what happens is that our boilers, right, which generate steam, they could either be running on gas or coal or briquette, right? Uh, so in Gujarat, where we have our big factories, right, we run on gas, okay? And that's what I'm talking about in terms of the input cost increase. It has, it has very little to do with our competition in Europe. Uh, I mean, we don't have too many competitors in Europe to begin with. So it's mainly, you know, I'm talking about the Indian situation with respect to input gas prices. Got it. And secondly, uh, on the CDMO side, uh, qualitatively, uh, you know, can you throw some light on how your conversations during the year have been gone? And what does it mean for the next couple of years, maybe, in terms of the traction in the business? Yeah, okay, sure. So, so like I said earlier, right, CDMO is doing well, right? Last year, we had a bit of a scare, right? Because it dropped from 200 crore to about 150, you know, it, it picked up then, right? But then, you know, obviously, we wanted to see it grow, right? And uh, the main problem was doctors and patients not seeing each other. But then that changed in the early part of last year. Of course, when Omicron hit, again, there was a bit of a problem. But uh, we still sort of saw, you know, the demand building up. So that was good. Uh, I expect that that will continue. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it will continue. And then with this fourth project coming online in third, fourth quarter of this year, I mean, we, we will see, we'll get a shot in the arm for the business, the CDMO business. And see, our experience uh, with CDMO has been that the, this is a stable business. Okay. It continues very well. Uh, there are a few, you know, sometimes, I mean, COVID was COVID, right? And COVID created its own problems. And so obviously this was unforeseen, but then, you know, um, overall the demand in, the, in normal times is expected to be uh, pretty solid, right? And growing. So that should help us, you know, to keep the business growing at a good clip. And as we add more projects, then you will see, you know, further growth, you know, coming as a result of that. Sorry, if I can take a, just squeeze it a little bit more. On the new projects, uh, you know, have, have there been any change in the kind of conversations you're having, uh, your ability to get contracts, uh, larger, bigger, more valuable contracts? Uh, any, I mean, has our ability to, to compete in this market, has it changed, improved, increased? Listen, we remain very confident on, on this, this is the, the prospect for the growth in the CDMO business. And this the basis for that, right, is that we've got a very broad portfolio, which, which basically also exhibits a very strong and broad chemistry range that we are able to offer. So apart from having five products, right, which itself are a pretty good, you know, uh, sort of business prospect with customers, uh, in the life cycle management space, as well as the uh, 505B2 and, uh, you know, incremental innovator space, we also are talking with uh, many customers, right, for, you know, chemistry-driven opportunities, but at a higher scale. Because our, we've been picky about not doing small stuff, right? We, we want to operate at, you know, at least phase three and beyond. So this is the kind of conversation that we've been having with potential, uh, you know, partners. And just going by the fact that the interest level is so high, I would say that this business uh, will continue to grow. And, uh, you know, I mean, and as and how we lock in something, we're going to, you know, put it across to the investment community that, look, we've locked in a project and this is now, you know, going to happen in a matter of, you know, some time. Thank you, and best luck. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tushar Manudhani from Motila Lothwal. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So,
So just on the uh, other expenses, which has been largely stable on absolute basis, while uh, definitely the logistics costs have you know uh, increased significantly. So any any other line item which has reduced or uh, or as such we have not faced uh, the significant increase in the logistics cost. So Tushar, uh, as you would reckon, our business portfolio is low tonnage, high value. So basically, what it means to ship out uh, the given amount of tonnage, the freight cost as a percentage of revenue becomes very small. In fact, it's less than one percent. So even if it goes, let's say, two x, it doesn't affect the number so much. Uh, it has not gone up so so much, but you know, just to give a sense of proportionality. And if you look at the trend, uh, the last three last two quarters is where we have seen elevated level of operating costs, and this is reflective of the energy price spike that we are experiencing. Understood. And secondly, on the similar lines, while it could be uh, high value, low volume, but uh, given that the transition time has increased, typically that is what we hear from the other uh, API companies as well. But uh, that has not led to increase in the inventory, at least in our case. So if you could also help us explain that. Yeah, so there is a mix uh, play in the inventory line, uh, Tushar. We have uh, strategically built up uh, inventories of raw materials. Whereas there is, uh, you know, a faster pickup of finished goods inventory uh, as compared to uh, last year. So that's the reason overall inventories have remained uh, more or less a kind of slightly improved uh, versus last year. But Tushar, if this China situation becomes like it drags on, right, then we don't have a choice but to cover more inventory for a longer period of time just to make sure the business doesn't get impacted. We haven't made those decisions yet, but we are actively watching that space. Got you, got you. And lastly, I'm not sure if you have shared this earlier, but just uh, trying my luck here. So, separately, have you shared the habit margins for CDMO and uh, API business? No, we haven't uh, kind of uh, quantified it. Uh, directionally, what we can say is that the margins for CDMO business are uh, considerably higher than the margins in general business. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, thanks for this. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Rahul G from Abacus Asset Manager. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Rahul. We are not able to hear you clearly. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. Man? yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, in the FY22, 2100 crores of top line, including the CDMO, how much of that will be COVID or COVID related, you know, ancillary kind of uh, products uh, uh, sales for us, sir? About 7 percentage uh, was the contribution last year. Okay, okay. So, sir, we are saying expecting the 12 percent growth in FY23, that would be X of the COVID portfolio, right? Or on the absolute basis, we are saying. So, Rahul, you, I think you asked about last year, right? The COVID contribution in our sales, yeah. fiscal 2021. 20, so, in fiscal 22, also we had, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, in FY22, it was 7 percent. Is that correct? No, no, no. FY21 was 7 percent. FY22 is less than 5 percent. Okay, okay, fair point. Got it, sir. This is helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the next question is on the line of Rupesh Tatya from Intel Sense Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, sir, and congratulations for very, very good set of numbers. Uh, my first question for is uh, this 400 kiloliters of expansion, backward integration in Ankaleshwar. Uh, what what kind of uh, you know margin expansion uh, we we should expect in two two three years from this? I think we'll have to repeat that question. Let can you can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yeah, Go ahead. Okay, my question, sir, is from Uncle. We have this backward integration project, right, in Ankaleshwar, which is which is fairly large size, 400 kiloliters. My question is, what kind of you know margin expansion can we see in two to three years? 
सो रुपेश द बैकवर्ड इंटीग्रेशन हैज टू पर्पज वन इज दी सप्लाई चेन सिक्योरिटी एंड ऑब्वियसली वी एक्सपेक्ट दैट इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑल्सो टू जनरेट कमेंसरेट रिटर्न इन लाइन विथ आवर एवरेज सो वॉट इट विल मीन इज दैट देर कुड बी मार्जिन एक्सपांशन लेट से टू द ट्यून ऑफ एटी टू हंड्रेड बेस एंड वॉट यू वुड लाइक टू सी इज दैट you know it it will add to investment it won't add to uh, top line but uh, in terms of uh, roc it should still help uh, maintain or increase the roc level so so one one percent uh, you know kind of sounds low so uh, let me ask you another way what is the, the capital outlay for this project and what is the payback period so we have not given individual block wise investment Uh, but uh, you know it's a it's it's a journey it's not a it's not an end point right so the first phase that we are doing here we are targeting backward integration of uh, four to five projects uh, from our top products portfolio and then we will continue to uh, do this uh, for top 20 products so it's a, it's it's not a you know a, a one time project it's a, it's a strategic shift that we are implementing in our facilities and the idea is that uh, we go backward integration integrated for all the key products uh, so let's say 20 products in a time frame of 3 to 4 years so which will come with additional investments over and above what we are currently doing so it will be in a phased manner okay okay sir my my second question sir is uh, you i mean we have a big presence in cvs uh, cardiovascular category and uh, one very big product cyclopin and cyclopin plus metformin i think is going off pace and uh, europe us in the second half of uh, fy23 so are we are we going to participate here in that market and uh, what kind of you know market formation do you see in terms of uh, number of players price erosion which product did you say cyclopin cyclopin yeah we we have cyclopin in our portfolio and uh, we are working with customers already so it it would uh, it would contribute that for sure so what 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 kind of aspirational market share do, do you do you hope to see some in in this? we want we won't get into that because we don't typically get it the into the product level discussion right it will all depend on how well the customers our customers do at the front end also right would we be top 5 would we be in top 5 so Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that that for sure. Okay, and 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 in terms of number of players and price erosion, so see that's what front end is very difficult to say, na. I mean, we don't know how the front end. Like recently, there was the lacosamide launch in the US, right? I mean, okay. the the expectation was there would be three players on day one, but it ended up being more. So I mean, you know, that's how that's how life is, right? Okay. So we don't know. Okay, and then sir, my my last uh, question is: uh, if, if I look at your presentation, your capacity uh, is going to double roughly so from FY21 uh, base in FY23, and then again there will be a Solapur uh, green field. So, so do you do you not think 12 to 14 percent is you know very very kind of low kind of guidance? And, and another thing is, I mean, there is a China plus one, and I, I mean, there's 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 been you know never been a more uh, there's a time to be ambitious in if you are from India. So do, do you not think 12 to 14 percent is kind of low? <coughs> okay, see, uh, we'd like to do more, and I'm sure that you know as the business conditions you know go back to normal the way they were, right? I'm sure you know we'll be able to uh, you know track a higher growth, but. on the capacity issue like bhavesh explained right uh, a significant portion of this capacity is a backward integrated capacity for backward integration so that doesn't play out that doesn't play out at the front end okay it, it's done with a more strategic intent in mind so we would have to then look at the incremental capacity that is servicing the front end business the front end api business okay and again you got to realize that these things don't happen in lockstep okay we basically plan capacities about 1 to 1 and a half year in advance depending on how our launches are coming along so uh, because it takes time to build capacity it takes some more time to qualify capacity so
so because of all that and seeing the way the launch plan is for the next two to three years is how the capacity planning happens and obviously the investment has to go in at that time so it will it will all play out but whether it you know we do it on a year to year basis right that that is something that's not possible okay okay and so just a small question sir any any uh, how, how would the approvals uh, happen for uh, ankaleshwar capacity and the dahej dahej blocks of approvals are already in place or will be easy to get or will be a long way so we had we had uh, we already dahej and ankaleshwar are inspected sites by major regulatory bodies so that's not a big challenge from an approval perspective but i mean so you don't get an individual approval on an incre- incremental capacity but you certainly have to validate products before you take them in so that's the additional time that it takes for us to be able to introduce products that's the advantage of doing brownfield versus greenfield in our business okay so so me, commercial contribution will be meaningful in h2 from these the facility yeah i did did mention that in an earlier question okay okay thank you thank you so much sir for answering my question so sure yeah sure thank you ladies and gentlemen in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in this conference we request you to limit your questions to two per participant only The next question is on the line of Sayan Mukherjee from Nomura. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so this 12 to 14 percent growth uh, that you're talking about, uh, can you split it up between how much you're factoring in price increase, uh, volume of existing products, and new launches? <laughs> so it's a mix of Sayan. It's a mix of price and volume. Okay, but largely coming from volume, you know. because while while there are price increases right i mean there are also certain erosions that happen in you know in different products so on the basket if i see right largely it's coming out of volume growth okay and if you look back let's say past couple of years or 3 years uh, on aggregate on your existing products does your price go up down or at an aggregate it's been flattish okay uh on an aggregate level prices usually stay stable okay because on the you know the base business which is about molecules that are like 3 to 4 years already in commercial right prices stay stable of course the uh, geographically it varies prices uh, vary quite a bit right depending on the geographies that uh, you know we are selling in so it's the same same api but you know depending on the geographies we would price it differently uh based on competition okay so uh prices tend to stay stable it's only when things get a little out of hand you know with input costs is when you know we go up and increase prices and typically you know when we when we uh, develop a next generation process prices come down of course margins don't get impacted because we are much more cost effective on the next process so we are able to retain or even improve margins but uh, the price does come down hmm. uh so your commentary suggests that you know margins with all these pressures and cost are largely going to be there uh, you know broadly in that range so i mean if you let, let's say if i take quarter 4 as an example uh, where you did 514 crores of top line 142 crores of ebitda with 27 28% margins uh if you were to factor in the cost that you see today right whether it is energy prices raw material prices would you say your ebitda number would fall by how much is it possible to quantify that or you know give some range if you were to factor in the cost that you see today so sayan the cost has been elevated for a while right uh, for different reasons and in different areas so we were hoping that quarter 2 should, should be normal it is not so if the situation remain like what it is today i think the margin should track to where we are in last couple of quarters if the things go bad environmentally then there will be some adverse impact which we can't predict right it will be speculative in nature and if things uh, 
become more normal than what they are then obviously we hope to see improvements okay so in that case you can potentially go back to 30% kind of a margin if things uh, you know energy prices and commodity prices sort of come down yeah it's all in our gross margin line if you can see if you see there that's where the you know the impact we are feeling and little bit in the other expenses because of energy prices so obviously if things go back to where they were let's say last year then uh, our business model uh, should support 30% ebitda margin okay understood uh, sir so do you, have you shared the numbers uh, you know the sale to glenmark uh, for this quarter and full full year so in this quarter it it would be around 36 37% full year would be around 39 40% okay okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of imran khan from longbow capital india capital advisors please go ahead Mr. Imran Khan, your line is in the talk mode. Please go ahead. Mr. Imran Khan, your line is in the talk mode. Please go ahead. Mr. Imran Khan, your line is in the talk mode. Please go ahead. as there's no response from the current participant that was our last question i would now like to close the call on behalf of the management of landmark life sciences we thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines thank you